Hello, welcome to this small workshop where we're going to talk a bit about basic SFX using Houdini and Unreal Engine. I will start off here with a presentation talking a bit about some of these basic facts, where are we going to build, and then later on I will jump into Houdini and Unreal and show you some of the things we can do with this. So let's get started. So overall, when we think about the basic of doing real-time effects, uh, we usually have like three different ways of like storing information or like visualizing things. And for example, one of these is textures. If you want to have an interesting noise, interesting effects, like flames, things like that, we can just store this into a texture. Like you could see here, like simple texture with something that could be used for a effect. Of course, we can combine this with meshes. Like what you see here is a, for example, like a fireball. Somewhere in your game, you have a character shooting a fireball. This is then a geometry within a texture with an information. And of course, we can then fill in the gaps or adding more details with using particle systems. Now, if you are using Unreal or Unity, then you can just use the built-in particle systems to spawn different amounts of particles to have all kinds of different cool effects to have more and more detail. So often these three things get combined together to make a cool and interesting particle uh, effect. So here is an example of this. So as you can see, this is an orb shooting a fireball. So we have combination of some of the geometries, which are which is the debris. You have some textures on the ground for the trail, and then all the small details and sparks are basically then particle systems from a game engine. So here, this is a combination of these three. So that's usually uh, how some of these effects are built in real time using some of these combinations. So what I want to focus a bit more on is flipbooks. We can do cool things with flipbooks. Now, essentially what are flipbooks is basically like we have a sequence of images and we're going to sort of like fly through them so we create an animation. So that's the most important thing here is we will create a images that will represent animation frames. Now, how this looks like in a game or for games is that we have a texture sheet and we divide it into multiple uh, spaces like grid and each of this grid space is then a frame of that effect. So we're going to render out different effects and this will then build up an actual simulation, for example. So here, this is for a flame uh, bonfire, for example. Here is a video of that. So on the left side, this is the output and on the right side is then the actual uh, flipbook texture. So you can see that in a game engine, we will loop over this texture and we will create a animated fire or flame effect. So we can have complicated effects now being used at real time simply by storing or rendering the effect into a texture. Now, when you are building this in a game engine, you will also need to build a shader for this. So you will have this logic that I just sort of like talked a bit about is that we sort of like need to zoom in on the first frame of our grid space and we're going to over time move to the next grid and so on. So we create this animation effect. So this is of course mainly done by offsetting the UV space. And what's important for this is of course having the animation uh, timing and of course also the number of rows and columns so we know exactly how my grid spacing in a texture is, has been divided. So specifically if you're using again uh, Unity or Unreal, uh, there are some pre-built options for you so you don't have to build this from scratch, you can start using some of these nodes out of the box. Let's already also discuss some pros and cons of using this flipbook technique. So overall, we are going to use simple geometry to view this in a game engine. So this can be a plane, this can be maybe a plane with some bends or twists to it, like very simple geometry that we will use to display this effect. So we can have complicated effects like a fire simulation, smoke simulation inside of the game engine at a more cheaper cost. So this is a useful way if you need these complicated effects in real time. This is also relatively cheap compared to actual using volumetric data, like importing a VDB, for example, in a game engine, which is not even supported by default in all game engines. So this is something that definitely is cheaper than trying to get real 3D volumetric data in the game engine. We can also do blending, remapping, and other shader tweaks. So since everything is available into textures, we can play around with this. We can play around with color variation, we can play around with blending different frames together, and so on. So we have a lot of options here in the shaders to start to tweak and blend things together. When it comes to the downside of using flipbooks is that this is not actually fully 3D. When we start to move around with our camera, we will quickly notice that this is not a 3D object. This is just a plane facing the camera with then the effect plate on it. So this can be very obvious in some cases. So we have to make sure that we make the right decisions on how we use them. We also have limits in the frames and pixels. 
So the more frames or the more renders we are going to make from our uh, simulation, we need to store them. So that means the more frames we have, the less pixels that will be available for each frame. So we need to make a good balance here and we need to think out how this is going to be handled. So talking a bit more about the frames and the resolutions is, let's say we have this game texture, which is a 2K by 2K resolution. Now, the ideal amount of frames I want to store is, for example, 64 frames. So that means that I will have to divide my texture into an 8 by 8 grid space. So I need to store all these frames in that texture. So what then eventually happens, or your final resolution of the image, will then be your texture divided by your grids. So in this case, the 2000 divided by 8, which will return in 256 pixels for each frame. This will be the quality of my frame in the game engine, which is not super high. Depending, of course, on the scaling you want these things to happen, you need to take some considerations of how much uh, time and resolution you can spend on these things. So now let's talk about making them. So the basic idea of this is that we just have a simulation in, in Houdini, for example, and that we place the camera, capturing the object, and we're going to render out multiple frames. So like I mentioned, we can, for example, render out 64 frames. This can be an 8x8 grid space. We can also have a 32 by 2 grid spacing or a 64 by one grid spacing. So there are many options you can do. You don't have to necessarily stick to square. Uh, we can also uh, have a more rectangular shapes of your grids and frames. Now, we made it actually easier for you to have a Labs Flipbook Notes. This is a note you can find in the Labs toolset. What you will have to do is the following. You will, of course, have to add your camera. Then you will need to say what type of volume or what is the volume I, that we need to render. And then we can just basically press out the render button. So that's a very basically and simplified the steps that you need to do. So those three things are the main things you will need to do out of the box. Now, when you press the actual render button, a few things will happen and you will see multiple outputs. So let's talk a bit about these outputs. So we have a color, emissive, normal, motion vectors, depth, and multi-directional contribution. So when we look at the color, this is just the color how we see it in the viewport. So it will just capture what is going on in the viewport and this will then be the result. So this will probably be the texture that you will need most of the time because this is then how it actually looks. Then we have our emissive map, which is of course being used to, in a game engine, boost this in the emissive channel. So if you want to like fake certain glow or bloom, we're going to use the emissive map to sort of like fake the core light of this flame to be more like an actual flame and brightness. We also then have, of course, the normal map, which is then used for adding some additional depth and highlights to actually feel like it's, it's a 3D volume. We also have then motion vectors, which can be used to blend frames together with motion data. We also have then a depth map, and this is then basically where your camera was, so the distance from your camera to the actual simulation that was in your scene. So this can be used, for example, for blending with transparency and have depth blending with the effect. And then we have the multi-directional contribution, and this is something special where we're going to use this information to actually play around with some of the lightning uh, in Game Engine. So we can use this. This is, of course, not needed if you don't want it. But you can use this map to sort of like fake or add some post-processing lights with a shader uh, based on this uh, texture map. Now, these are quickly here combined all the maps that you can have. You don't need to use all of them. If you, for example, only want to have the color and the normal map, that's up to you how much of this information you want. The more information you have, the also more complicated and bigger your shader needs to be to use all this information correctly. Now, if you talk a bit about the Houdini 19.5 demo, I build a couple of these examples. So we have the Brazier Fire, the Flaming Sword, the Particle Trails, the Magic Trails, and also a Torch. So here are some examples. So here we can see the Brazier Flames. And in a moment, we will also take a closer look at that. So this is again from Houdini simulation, fully brought here into Unreal and Unity as well. Here's then uh, the trail or a shot for, for example, like a gun or a weapon. We can have a trail of that. Then the last thing I want to show you is then, for example, the flaming swords with the sword swinging from left to right with this nice flaming effect. That was my presentation on it. Let's now jump into this demo. Make sure you have Houdini installed, the lab tools installed, and Unity 5 installed. We will need all of them. And I will show you now how we can build these effects. So here we are now in Houdini and let's look a bit at our setup. So this is a file you can get as well. And this is also some cache data that we can use. So let's go in this file and we can see that we have this node structure that creates this effect. 
So what you need to know from this is I'm not going to fully go over each note. So this is basically then essentially creating the starting volume. So you can do multiple steps, create multiple uh, values like density, temperature, burn value, things like that. So what is special here is that this is just our initial starting source. From this source will actually our solver start. So once we fill it in the uh, solver here, uh, you can see it actually turns into like this flame colors. So you can change these settings if you want, or you can just leave it as this. What is important for you to know is the actual voxel size. So this actually determines the quality of your simulation. So the lower this goes, that means the lower your voxels will be, and, and so far your quality will increase. The higher this value, the higher your voxels, which means that we will have a more rougher simulation. So definitely play around with this because the, the lower you go, the higher calculation time you will add to this simulation. This first frame, as you can see, it's our first frame. It's not that interesting to use. So I will do a time shifting of 15 frames. So my first frame now is actually plus 15. So we are taking the current frame number and we are saying add 15 frames to this. This is now being more useful in our simulation. So now next step is then also caching the data. So I have my simulation and I want to cache this so I don't have to recalculate this every time I uh, load Houdini. So we're just like caching this locally. What is interesting to do here as well is to think about how much frames would I like to need. So if I have a, if I have a flip book, that's for example, uh, 64 frames. In my case, as you can see, I go from frame one to frame 64. So I'm only rendering that a specific amount. I'm not rendering more than I need to. So that's just good to know in case by the default might be a couple hundred frames. If you're going to cache out a couple hundred frames, you will of course increase the time that it needs to cache out and calculate the simulation. So once we have this uh, cached out, I'm just going to make it loopable. So this is a node that makes it just a loop by default. You can play around with some settings here, but by default does a really good job at just making this loopable, especially, especially for like this flame uh, effect. Then the last thing is then adding a pyro bake volume. This can actually be used to then uh, tweak the visuals a bit. So here we have the smoke tab, so I can disable smoke and we can see that the smoke is fully gone. So I can just now enable this, I can intend, make this a bit less intense, I can make this more intense. We can play around with this. So that's roughly it for sort of like the simulation setup. So from here, you can, for example, plug in your own simulation. If you have made something else, uh, plug in your own simulation and then use the, these couple nodes to then further handle uh, what you might need there. In terms of then actually rendering out the flipbook of this, we're going to place a ROP network. So this is the rendering network. So we're going to open this, double click, and we want to then place a flipbook texture node. So in this node, as I explained from the presentation, we need a camera and our baking volume. So let's start off with the camera. So we're going to actually jump back to our object layer, maybe make some more room here. And here we can either just type in camera or what we can also do is go here to uh, this menu and we can just say make a new camera. So I will make a new camera from my angle that I currently have. And we also want to change here our handle so we can actually, for example, play around with this, zoom out and make sure we have sort of like a, to, the correct framing. So as you can see right now, this is sort of like outside my camera and will not be in my flipbook. So we probably want to adjust here our view uh, values of the camera. So by default, the resolution here is set to uh, 720p which doesn't necessarily matter that much uh, because the flipbook will actually do some overriding as well. What is more important here is actually sort of like the aspect ratio. So if you want to save this, for example, in the square format, uh, I'm just going to then switch, for example, this to a square shape. So again, the resolution doesn't matter that much as well actually matter more uh, in the flipbook settings in a moment. So this is actually then the proper size of my flipbook uh, that you can see. What we can also do here, in case you don't want a perspective view, we can change this to, for example, orthographic. Um, and we can play around here with the orthographic settings and make it something like so. So this is something that 
you will have to tweak uh, if you want to have orthographic or perspective. That's up to you. It might give better results or better expectations depending on these values. So let's say we are pretty happy with our results. We can always go a bit back and forward. Um, but the main thing that we especially need to do here is making sure that we fully capture our flame simulation here in our bounds. So don't do something like this uh, because it will actually just render out only this part. So make sure it's fully captured. Uh, there, can al there can always like be some cleanup done afterwards and tweaks. But let's just keep it simple for now and just make it a square and capturing the whole simulation. Now let's go back here to our uh, ROP network that we created. And I want to make it a bit more space here. So we want to fill in a camera. So we can now click on this button and we can just say our camera one. So I only had one camera in my scene, so it's easy to find. Then we have our pyro big volume. We also going to click this button and we're going to look for the pyro a uh, big volume. So here it's this one. If you have multiple Pyro big volumes, give them better naming so you can find them easily. So then we have our start and end frame, which is from one to 64 frames, as I mentioned. We then also here have a resolution for each frame and of course our rows and columns. So this is now very important to understand. So our total resolution will now be an 8K texture. So this might of course be very high for your project. So for me, the 8x8 eight eight is actually already correct because I have 64 frames. So 8x8 eight eight is 64. So you can change this to whatever you want. For example, like 2x4 if you want something else. So you can play around with these values. But for me, 8x8 eight eight is correct. So only going to lower the resolution here. Uh, let's say my final output is a 4K texture, which is still on the higher side. But in Game Engine, we can still clamp this to be uh, displayed at a lower texture. Then here we have our default rendering locations, which is just based on the hip file. Uh, we have some uh, limitations here, so just leave this by default. And then important here is the color spacing. So if you want to use the ACES color space, make sure you're, they are also installed. If they are not installed, you can press this button to help you out, or you can just leave it very basic and just use the default of Houdini, which is the gamma 2.2 value. So this is basically the default value once you're happy with the settings, you can just click render and wait for the renders. Interesting to know as well is that we also have render passes. So here are the, all the render passes, like the final color, the emissive, the multi-directional contributions, the normal, the motion factor, and the depth. So you can render out them individually, or you can just say that we need to skip, for example, the emissive pass. So that's up to you if you want to only render out a few of these. Uh, it's the same here with the export menu is that we can say what type of data we want to export and play around with this. So for this tutorial, I will say that we will render out everything. So if I now press render here, it will render out every single texture uh, that we have on this view. Now, once everything is rendered out and we go to this folder uh, where this is saved, so under your hip file, and then you should see a render folder with this uh, files. So we have all the maps for the game engine. And most importantly, here is the FC, which stands for final color. So if we open this, we can then see here our final color and flame. So this is what we have now. And let's jump into the game engine and talk a bit more about this. So now into Unreal, let's bring everything in here. So we can just make a new folder. We can right click and say something like effects, uh, flames, or flipbook effects or something like that. So we have a folder where we can then drag in our textures. So as you can see, I have now my textures. Uh, we can, for example, open them. And as you can see, they are 4K resolution. So if you want to change this, uh, we can use here the LOD slider. If we, for example, say uh, 2, that means that we're now displaying an in-game resolution of only 1K. So this is like a, so this can be a way on like getting some more control of that if you want to uh, lower this. Another thing to do with our textures is to make sure to set them in the right format. We can do this by right-clicking go here to scripted actions and use the flipbook settings. This is mainly recommended for using the motion vectors to make sure that they are rightly imported so we can use them later on. The other thing with this is that we need a shader. So we can build this fully from scratch, do everything yourself, but actually Houdini offers a shader for you. So I already have it installed. Uh, so under plugins, I have a, a material and I have a template for my pyro uh, shader. 
If you don't have this installed, I will quickly show you how you can get this. So in Houdini, we have here a, a real-time shader and we can just click that this button to then access uh, the content files and the materials. So we will now have this menu pop-up that will hold a folder uh, with actually the Unreal files here that we will use. So there is some explanation here that you can follow. So what you basically then want to do is you want to know where your Unreal project is and you want to create a folder called plugins. So it might be there, it might not be there. You can just make a new folder and call it plugins. Then inside plugins, you want to just drag and drop here the side effects labs folder. So drag this folder. And again, this then holds the actual uh, material here in the content. So it holds the material. So of course you will need to probably uh, restart Unreal or make sure you had, or make sure you had it closed before. And then further, you have a folder now plugins, which you might need to here under settings enable. So you can see the plugins and then you can just find the side effects, labs, content, material, templates, and so on. So what we want to do from this is uh, we can open this already. We can either make a duplicate, we can make an instance, you can do what you would like. So we're just going to make a duplicate here and I'm going to drag this over my uh, flame effect. So we're going to just move it over here. And what we will do for now is just make an instance and uh, call it material instance and then uh, flames. So now let's open this instance. We should see some of our settings and we then here at the bottom have our textures. So let's grab these textures and plug them in. So we're going to use all of them since we also rendered out all the textures. So emissive, the final color, the motion directional one and two, and then the motion vectors and normal map. So this is all the textures that you can use. You don't, of course, again, don't have to use all of them. So by default, uh, my rows and columns are eight by eight. So that's the default and of course, that just works fine because I use the default settings. So let's now just press save and bring in a simple plane for testing. So let's just grab shape plane and we can now make this a bit bigger, rotate this and we can just plug our uh, flame effect on this. So let's just do it like here. And I rotated it wrong. So now this is the correct rotation. So I can see like with Unreal 5, they of course used the emissive to have some additional light as you can see, um, but there might be some settings we want to tweak. You might see some shakiness here and that's actually from the motion vector not being fully correctly imported. If you remember when I imported my textures, I also had to right click and use that scripted action to make sure they are correctly imported. Right now, I'm just going to lower here the scale and the best way might actually be to restart in real to make sure the textures are fully correctly imported. Um, so we can play around with other uh, values. Um, so this is the animation speeds. And in our case, we might want to put this a bit faster, maybe let's say two, five, something like this, or maybe just point two. So that looks pretty good. And uh, further, again, there are a lot of settings. I'm not going to go over each one of them. So we can play around with some of the color values. Um, so as you can see, you can get some more stranger colors. The default is pretty good. Uh, interesting also as well is then here actually the alpha. So this controls, of course, the alpha transparency cutoff. So as you can see, if I just put this to zero, it will just take, take very roughly that border. So we can then tweak this depending on how much smoke you want. So if you want like a push the smoke a little bit, I can actually recommend lowering this value. As you can see, we are like seeing the smoke like a little bit more, uh, but the default is like a bit higher. And then here we have some additional scattering effects. Uh, what I sometimes do is here at the bottom, I play around and boost some of the scattering intensity. So it will actually boost the emissive to a higher value, as you can see. So that's basically how we can go from that Houdini simulation now fully into here Unreal having this fully ready uh, to be used somewhere. If we now take this effect into its original context, which was used uh, in, a, in this brazier, as you can see here. So here we have these logs catching fire and we can see we have this uh, effect really naturally, really just basically what it was in Houdini, now exactly how we had it here. 
if I have it perfectly here set up how it perfectly was set up in Houdini, and this is now a 2D plane, so this is not fully three-dimensional. So that's of course a downside of using these flip books because they are so simplified in a way that they don't necessarily feel uh, 3D. So this isn't especially specific in this case as it has to match uh, the logs uh, and so on. Now, what I can demo here further is actually is something that I've not talked about is then here our depth range and our depth blending. So let me disable depth blending and you can see that my plane sort of like cuts here in my model, in my 3D geometry. So with using depth blending, we can actually nicely sort of like blend with the flames and our geometry. So if I play around with this range, you can see we can sort of like push this further, push this back. So we are actually using the depth map that we uh, rendered out, which is stored here in this image. So here, so we are using this depth map to sort of like now blend with like the depth uh, buffer that we have so we can blend these objects better together. In this case, this is extremely useful if we really need to have something that really matches the, the, the flames with like the object so we can do a depth blending and play around with this value as you can see like we're blending this with the logs here. So it's really cool that this is a feature that you can use. Now last thing uh, to show you here is as I mentioned this is not really full 3D we can play around with a particle system to make it feel a bit more 3D. So this is a Niagara particle system, uh, made some couple tweaks. And you can see that this is a more three-dimensional feel. So it's just essentially like camera facing planes, but it feels a bit more three-dimensional. Uh, so this is what you would probably then use if you want something a bit more three-dimensional. So if you're not familiar with the particles, here is a quick rundown. So it's a very basic particle. Uh, so we are doing a burst spam of 10 planes, basically, of 10 particles. So they are just 10 camera facing planes. Then I spam these planes here on a box or a plane shape specifically. So as you can see, they are just spammed on a plane. Uh, and then for the other values, it's just the same uh, default stuff. Uh, and you can then fill in your own uh, material here that we made. There are some other settings and things you can do. There is even some built-in functionality for UV animations and so on. Um, but this is like the super basic thing you can now do with this. Uh, and you can create something like this. Now, when it comes down to a conclusion, uh, there are a few things that I want to talk about before uh, ending this. So one thing that you always need to keep in mind is caching and rendering of this data. So if you're working with high quality simulations, so if you set the voxel size very, very low, you can have very long times on caching data, rendering data. So this is something you keep in mind. If you keep if you keep things on a very low quality and very rough quality, things will go pretty quickly in the rendering stage. It can also be good to do preview renders if you're not sure if you have to write uh, rows and columns or you have to write resolution. Like for example, only render out the color maps and work with that for a moment to like see if everything works bit out. Also keep in mind using the color spaces. Uh, like I showed you here, we just used the basic default of Sudini because that will work, but there are other color spaces you can use. So make sure if you use the ACES that they are also installed, but it's definitely uh, something to keep an eye out for that you're using the correct color space because this will definitely give you other results depending on the color space. And of course, the way you are dividing your frames uh, matters a lot. So in this case, this is a particle trail. So this is sort of like a shot that goes uh, in a horizontal way. And we're just stacking all these frames vertically. So this is a texture that mainly has a horizontal lines and doesn't have like eight by eight grid spaces. And last thing I want to talk about is when I was building the flaming sword setup, this has a bit more thinking behind it. So let me first of all show you what the flaming sword was. So here is the flaming sword and I had to match a animated sword with an animated flaming effect. So here's the first version of that. So you can see here that it looks decent, but it feels off. Like the flame feels a bit like uh, flickering sometimes, like it's not really attached to the sword. So this was the first version of this, but it was not the greatest version. So what I'm essentially doing here is I'm just like I showed you here is I place a camera in the scene and I capture the effect. So that's it, nothing special, just capturing the effect. Now, what is then tricky is because this sword is animating, 
we need to then in the timeline make sure that they fully match uh, with each other which you can see here in this frame the flames are a little bit behind the sword so they're not fully matching uh, the flip book with that, the actual sword so this requires more time to then lay out and think about now what would be a better way or what was my solution in this case is we can actually animate the camera while capturing the flip books so I'm now sort of like attaching the camera to the sword so this way I can make sure that my flames are attached to the sword. Now this is then here an example of uh, Unity. This works both Unity and Unreal. So we have now a plane that is rotating with the sword and then the flipbook just uh, holds uh, on that. So this way the sword and the flame are always attached to each other. So the main thing that I wanted to like, give you away with this is that we can also animate the camera in flipbook tools. So if you animated the camera, you will also have a different flipbook. Um, so in this case, this is the result, what I have. And if you look closely here, if I just draw a line, uh, we can see that my flame will always be perfectly centered and will either be on the left or the right of this line, which is representing my sword. This is something that you can do. And I just wanted to share this, that this might be interesting if you have to do something similar. And that was it for this workshop. So I hope you learned something. I hope some of these things are inspiring you to try something out for yourself. And thank you for watching.